We pray to you, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the one who created the whole earth, the one who took on flesh and became like one of us in order that we might see your glory. You are the one who was found in human likeness but gave your life as a ransom for us all to pay the penalty for our sin and make the way for redemption. And after becoming an offering for our sin, you rose in victory over death. And now you, Lord Jesus, sit as the King, as the Savior and the Redeemer. And how wonderful it is to know on this day that you have pursued us. How wonderful it is to know that we were lost but now have been found. How amazing it is to be found in you, to be found in Christ. Might we know today in our hearts that it is only by your death and resurrection that we are in Christ. Justified by grace and having redemption. Dead to sin but alive in Christ. Knowing that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Knowing that we have been set free in Christ. Knowing that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ knowing that we're bound in friendship with one another in Christ, that we are sanctified in Christ, and that in Christ we have been led in triumphal procession, victorious, victorious over sin and Satan and death, and that in Christ we are a new creation, that in Christ we have the hope of one day being resurrected. All because of you and the power at work in you that has been poured into our hearts through faith in Jesus. Lord, today give us the courage to live graciously by the cross, Give us the courage to live boldly by the resurrection. May our worship not be religion devoid of victory, but may we seek to know you and the power of your resurrection, believing that our sufferings in this day are only pointing to another day, a day in a place where there will be no more tears, where there will be no more chaos, where there will be no more pain, where there will be no more despair. That your resurrection is the promise we live by. It's the hope that we have that one day we will be glorified as you are already glorified. And we pray into that glory now and forever in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a seat. I noticed you all came to 10 o'clock service. Hope you found a parking space. It's so great to have you all here today on Easter Sunday, one of the best days of the whole year. And in the first service, we had a little um, time of, uh, of prayer and um, uh, thanksgiving for Pastor Spencer, who chose Easter Sunday to be his last Sunday. And so um, we did that earlier in the service, but I wanted to just let you all know that so you can say thank you to him on the way out the door, especially if this is your church and you've been blessed by his ministry. Um, it's been a good weekend. I don't know if you're here for Good Friday, but the essence of the message on Good Friday was that God cares more about resurrection than he does about rescuing us sometimes. And if we're expecting God to rescue us and we're crying out to God for a deliverance from a set of circumstances, he may remain silent. And the truth of it is this, is that he might remain silent, not because he doesn't love us, not because he can't deliver us, but because the deliverance may take on a different form than we even think. It might be a resurrection. Before we get into the Easter message today, I wanted to reflect a little bit more on what happened just shortly after Jesus' death. Look at two characters who um, enter into uh, Jesus' death and and, and perform his burial and see what's going on in their hearts. We know the story, Matthew tells us, that at the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus cried out with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. John tells us what happens next. He says, after these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who is a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear, for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus, bound it in linen cloths with spices, as is the custom, the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, in which no one had yet been laid. So Jesus 
So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. So into Jesus' death comes these two characters, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. They were both men of means. They were both men of the word. They'd studied the scriptures. They were both men who faced what for us would be a familiar tension, a tension of the heart. You know, that tension of the heart that desperately wants to be a follower of God, to be a follower of Jesus, but wrestles with the implications of that, wrestles with the cost of that. These two men, men of tension, whose heart struggle had led them to the cross, came. They came to Jesus. They came with good religious intentions publicly to give Jesus in, in death what they could not give him in life, which was their sacrifice and their devotion. Sacrifice in the form of a tomb, devotion in the form of a proper burial, a burial of dignity, a burial according to Jewish customs. The Bible tells us that they'd known Jesus. They'd been moved by Jesus. It was to Nicodemus that Jesus had said, you need to be born again. It was to Nicodemus that Jesus had said that verse that many of us know, that God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Those were the words spoken to Nicodemus. And those words had to have taken a hold of his heart, even though his mind could not comprehend them. And though the words of the past rang echoing in his mind, the reality of Christ's death made the hope of being born again, of having eternal life, seem to have been a false hope. That if the one who proclaimed a message of eternal life was dead, then all hope was lost. Lost. Arriving at the cross, the two of them see a lifeless, bloody pound of flesh. Nicodemus' stomach turns at the sight and smell of death, and I'm sure Joseph skin crawled as he touched the cold body and sticky blood. Surely the words of Isaiah came to their minds, that his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any man, and his form marred beyond human likeness. They lived that out. They saw that. They pulled the nails out of his hands and his feet. They separate his body from the cross. As gruesome as it was, they may have been relieved that they had not been there to witness it, or at least they tell themselves that. They come, then come to mind the further words of Isaiah, that he was despised and rejected, like one whom people hide their face from, and we esteemed him not. And have those words of Isaiah cut to their heart, despised and rejected, hiding esteeming him not. Their conscience stands condemned that they have rejected, that they have hidden, that they have belittled by not standing up for truth, by not speaking a word in his defense. But each of them decide that though guilty in conscience, there's something that they can do. Each of them regretful that they hadn't spoken at the trial or stepped up to carry the cross or at least come to comfort his mother and his friends, make a declaration that in death they will honor him. And so they do. They wash Jesus' body with water and they beautify it with fragrance. He is wrapped with a prayer shawl and then proper burial clothes. He is placed in a beautiful tomb in a serene garden. Joseph's own tomb that he was willing to give for Christ. It will be a good place for them to come and honor him in death. It will be a good place for pilgrimage, hopefully for many years to come. The women who saw him die hopefully will be happy about that place. Maybe it will soften and numb the painful images they carry in their minds from Golgotha. And so Joseph and Nicodemus, after doing what they could, go back to their homes. They go back to their privacy. They go back to their secrets. Heart achings and consciences in turmoil. Three days later, the words reach them. The women, the women who have stood by Christ to the very end, are the first to go to the garden to that lovely place so that they can remember, but they don't have to remember. Instead, they get to experience. They go to remember, but they find resurrection. The body's gone. There's nowhere for them to place their worship. There's no shrine at that grave because there's no body in that place. There's no grief in that place because there's no death in that place. They don't have to remember because they've just experienced real hope, true hope for the very first time. Three days later, the words reach the secret disciples. They hear those words with their ears, but their minds cannot comprehend. They hear them with their ears, their minds cannot comprehend, but their hearts, oh, their hearts longed for it to be true. 
The news of Jesus' resurrection brings the remembrance of those words. You must be born again. Could it be that this is what he meant? Could it be that the hope of eternal life, of new life is real? Could it be that there is new creation, that there is freedom beyond sin, that there is life beyond death? Their hearts needed this to be true. Their hearts needed it to be real. And they believed. They believed in their hearts. And at that moment, they were saved. In that moment, they realized that death leads to resurrection, that hearts that are lost can be found, and that the new life is not a secret life. What they discovered was the resurrection forces us out of secret by giving grace to our guilty consciences. It has the power to change the course of our lives. Because the resurrection power, that is something else altogether. With the resurrection, Jesus showed us that God doesn't hide. With the resurrection, Jesus showed us that God's power is something greater than we can ask or imagine. Jesus showed us by the resurrection that it is something that can be known and experienced. Even if in the moments of our despair, in the moments of our suffering, He doesn't re rescue us, there is always the possibility of resurrection. Paul knew this. Paul was living his life killing Christians. There's nothing worse than that, I think. It's right up there. Until Jesus came to him. What Jesus? The resurrected Jesus. The resurrected Jesus comes to him, meets with him, and changes the trajectory of his life. You see, he met with Jesus and experienced the power of the resurrection. And Paul wrote... That if we confess our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. We will be saved. And we've often teach, and rightfully so, that it's belief in Jesus' death on the cross that saves us from the penalty of our sin. And that still remains true even though these verses say that we're saved by belief in the resurrection. You see, we're saved by the power of sin, Satan, and death by the resurrection. The resurrection shows us that God's power is for us even now. That there is life now. That because of God's Christ's resurrection, the Spirit has come into all of our hearts on belief in that. And this is what the Spirit does. It brings Christ in us. Romans 8, if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. That's the power of the resurrection, to bring us into right relationship with God, that we can actually talk to Jesus, that we can actually approach Jesus, that we can actually come to Him and ask Him, not just for rescue, but for resurrection. The Spirit guarantees that. Why? Because Jesus is alive. We can know the close nearness of Christ through His presence. We can know the promises of God. That even though our bodies may die, there is always life because our hearts are filled with the Spirit and given righteousness by the Spirit, by our faith. That fate, which is death to all, has been replaced with the promise. That the resurrection shows us not just the promise of eternal life, but the promise of new life now. And this is the God's work amongst those of us who are pursuing it, that there is new life because we've been born again. That we're no longer defined by our failures of the past that still cause us to flinch. That we're no longer need to avoid our guilt because there is no guilt. The removal of guilt, the removal of shame is the power of God. It's the power of God shown to us in the resurrection that we might become the people of God, that we might become his children. This needs to be our long for reality. That the resurrection was not a date in history, was not a moment in time. It is our moment in our time. It is the moments of our day. That's why Paul cries out, crying out to God, crying out to the people of the Philippians, that he wanted to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. That he might share in the sufferings, becoming like him in his death. That by any means possible, Paul writes, I may attain resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or that I am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. We see the love of God displayed for us on the cross. But we long, 
We long for more. We long to experience that love in a resurrection, in a victory, that it belongs to you and me. Not a moment in time, not just historical fact, a power, a resurrection power that belongs to you and me. It is God's power. It is life-giving. It brought Jesus back to life, and it brings our dead hearts back to life. Gordon Fee says this, Paul knows nothing of the rather gloomy stoicism that is so, op- uh, so often exhibited in historic Christianity. Paul knows nothing of that where the lot of the believer is basically saying that of slugging it out in the trenches with little or no sense of Christ's presence or power. On the contrary, the power of Christ's resurrection, which was the greater reality for him. This is what Paul longs for. I want to know Christ. I want to know the power of the resurrection. And if it be that I have to share in his sufferings, then so be it, because I want that kind of power. But we wrestle under the weight of our struggles. We wrestle under suffering, wondering why God won't deliver us, wondering why God won't rescue us. And could it be, could it be that when we embrace the suffering, that when we embrace the death, we would experience new life? But that's where we step off. The assumption around resurrection is that you have to die first. To have victory, you need to suffer first. And we get so consumed with our present reality, with our short-sightedness, that we can't see beyond that. We don't have the faith to see beyond what is here and now and believe that maybe, just maybe, Christ can deliver this, deliver us from this. How do we know that? Because He's alive. He's alive. We just talk to Him. We don't treat this day like some stupid day to give out chocolate. It's a nice perk. Bad chocolate. Sin, actually. Bad chocolate, sin. But that's another message for another day. Paul's longing is so profound. It's so powerful. I want to know Christ. I want to know the power of the resurrection. And if that requires me to die, then so be it. But for me, for me, my life right now consumes so much of my thinking. See, I will do anything, anything possible to stave off death. And aren't we that way? We think so much, so much, and are concerned so much about our own significance. We worry about our legacy. We get to that place, everybody does, when they wonder what will be written in stone on their tombstone. Why? Because maybe, maybe somebody will remember me. And we think that if that's the most permanent thing, then I guess that should be enough. What goes on my tombstone reflects who I was in life. I've been to old tombstones, have you? That wears off. They're just slabs of rock that nobody remembers them by. We get so consumed with that, whether our lives will mean something, whether we'll be remembered, whether or not we matter, whether or not we ever will matter. And so we work really hard in our jobs to show that we care. We work so hard in our families to give them everything they want. We work so hard to prove to God and to everybody that we're trying to do our best and we're exhausted without rest, dying of fatigue because we're trying to prove ourselves significant enough to be remembered for what we have done with our lives. We want to live forever, but we're enslaved to that death. The truth is is that many of us think of those things that we've centered our lives on that we fear losing and in fear losing now control us. We think about the relief from the stress of life. We think about acquiring and consuming. We think about adding a little life to our lives And when the stress comes, we just want to escape it for a little bit. And so we eat and drink to find some sort of escape and call it merriment. We pursue pleasures, dangerous pleasures. Pleasures like sex without love, escape without self-control. Pleasures like spending without stewardship. And we're addicted. We're addicted to anything anything that will give us a temporary sense of relief, a temporary sense that we might be secure. And all the while, all the while, Easter remains being true. 
The power of the resurrection remains true. The things, those things, those things we think about are the things we're called to die to. But they've enslaved us. They brought cre- uh, chaos into our lives. And that's why we need to have faith. Faith that Easter matters. And it matters not just on a spring Sunday. It matters each and every day. Because with the faith comes the power. With the faith comes the courage to embrace the death. Joseph and Nicodemus, while Christ was dying, was too, were too worried about protecting their lives. And when Christ was gone, they were guilty and ashamed. But thanks be to God who brought Jesus back to life so that they could have their consciences washed clean, so they could see that those things that they were trying to protect were the very things that they were to die to. That that's how we know Christ and the power of His resurrection. It means dying to sin, dying to death, and dying to ourselves. We die to sin. That through Christ we've put to death everything that is earthly in us. And we're still to put that to death. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Why? Because those things are going to kill you. Not because God doesn't want you to have a good time. Those things will destroy your life. And he says, you don't need to live that way anymore. We're dead to sin because Christ removed the penalty. And sin couldn't hold him. Sin couldn't bind him. Sin couldn't kill him. He rose to new life. And so what we do is we hate our sin because it cost Christ his, our, his life. And it's costing us our lives. We despise shame. We refuse to live enslaved to those powers, to the power of lust, greed, jealousy, and hopelessness. We see that though Jesus removed the penalty of sin, that means he can also remove the power of it in our lives. That we can see that we need not be defined by our failures, that we need not be controlled by our guilt, but rather live beyond those things. Because the Spirit lives in us. Jesus rose from the dead, according to the Spirit, is seated at the right hand of the Father, sent the Spirit in our hearts, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Freedom. Freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And that freedom comes from believing that Christ's resurrection removes our failures by removing our guilt, that Christ's resurrection removes our shame by removing our sin, that Christ's resurrection removes the power of temptation by removing the power of sin, and that there is always forgiveness even in the midst of our failures. We die to sin. We can die to ourselves. We can die to ourselves. All those things that we're worried about protecting, our significance and our security, Jesus said that. He saw our profound passion to protect ourselves as a great hindrance to experiencing Him. That's why He says this, if anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself. He must take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake is the one who will save it. How? By rejecting self. Rejecting selfish ambition, rejecting selfish intention, rejecting selfish thoughts, rejecting the pursuit of significance and security apart from God. We reject those things because those things kill our marriages, they kill our families, they kill our friendships. That we hate our profound self-justification when it comes to being anger and bitter and defensive. There's no longer to defend anybody if we're dead to ourselves, but how enslaved we are to that how defensive we are in everything. And the shame of that is that Jesus is alive. And the resurrection power says there's nobody to defend. That that person is righteous and holy because of grace. The power of Christ's resurrection means that we no longer have to prove ourselves, no longer have to succeed, and no longer have to live in fear. The power of Christ's resurrection means that we can be truly honest with who we are and know that we're never, ever going to be rejected by God. The power of Christ's resurrection means that we no longer need to fight for our rights and find justice in this life because we all know deep down that that's a myth anyways. The power of Christ's resurrection means that you and I can find harmony with one another, that we can find reconciliation. We can find we can find that just as we're brought back from the dead in Jesus, so is the possibility of our marriages and our families being brought back from the dead, even though we killed them. 
And finally, we're dead to death. Paul writes, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? I want to know Christ and the power of His resurrection because to experience the power of the resurrection is to reject the power of prolonged grief, of living sad our whole lives, of rejecting the power of doubting God's goodness when we experience sadness. The power of Christ's resurrection means that we no longer have to live under hopelessness of death or the fear of hell. Said here before, I'll say it again. A Christian is someone who hates their sin and isn't afraid to die. What kind of life is that? A wonderful life. I don't need to protect anything. I don't need to worry about what goes on my gravestone. Someone else can worry about that. I'm dead to death. I don't need to carve out a legacy Because when this life ends, I will be forever in His presence, forever bathed in His love, forever knowing His kindness, forever being blessed by His presence. Because in that place, there is no more tears, there is no more crying, there is no more sadness. We are sad temporarily on this earth. We grieve for a little while, but we do so with a hope, a realistic hope, a powerful hope, a resurrection-based hope that it won't define the rest of our lives. We don't have to be sad. We can have sad days. We can be depressed for seasons. But a resurrection power that comes from knowing Christ means living with hope in spite of that, in spite of those things. The power of Christ's resurrection means we no longer have to worry about whether or not we'll be remembered because we no longer have to worry about fearing death. Bonhoeffer, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, man who died for his faith, said the cross is laid on every Christian. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. Why? So he'd be resurrected. We call out to God for rescue. Christ calls us to come and die. Die to sin, die to ourself, and die to our fears. Why? So that we can know the resurrection power. So that we can have new life. When we embrace that death, when we kill our sin, when we reject ourself, When the sin is dead, that's where we find freedom. When the self is rejected, then there is peace. When death is not feared, there is always hope. And I want to invite you to believe this today. To believe that if Jesus is alive, then He's present. And if He's present, He's shown to us the power of God. I want to invite you to believe that with your hearts. Even though our minds can't believe it to be true, our hearts desperately want it to be to hear maybe for the first time that Jesus is alive and that by His Spirit, you and I can be alive. To hear for the first time that there is hope because there's resurrection. To invite you for the first time to believe in the love of God and that that power has the power to change everything. And then to see that that is so much greater than all of those things we're scared to die to. I want to invite you to believe this by praying with me today, which is simply talking to Christ who is alive. So let's bow our heads. Let's bow our heads and pray. If you walked in off the streets here today, you felt like something was pulling you. You don't know why you're here. Or maybe you do now. You were looking for hope. You were looking for grace. You were looking for love. And God brought you to the cross. God brought you to the cross to see the depth of His love. But that God brought you to the cross to show you the power of His love. If you want to be resurrected, if you want new life, I'm going to invite you to pray this prayer with me. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I believe that you've died for my sin and that you rose again from the dead. Right now I turn from my sin and by faith open my heart and my life to you. I confess you as God, my God, and my Savior. Thank you for saving me. And I just ask you all to keep your heads bowed and eyes closed. But if you prayed that prayer for the first time, would you just raise your eyes and look at me? Thank you. I praise God for you. Church, let us pray together. Lord Jesus, we bow before you in humility. 
seeing that the truth of the gospel still has the power to change lives. Still has the power to change lives today. That the resurrection, though historical, is spiritual. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you've brought our dead hearts back to life. We thank you, Lord God, our Father, that it was your will for your Son to be beaten, scorned, mocked, crucified, and to die so that he might be resurrected and so that we might be resurrected by our belief in that. God, cause us to pray each and every day the prayer of Paul. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. And I want to share in his suffering, becoming like him in his death, that I also might, that I also might be, be made alive again. Give us the courage to die to our sin, to hate it. To die to our self, to our selfish ambition, to our vain conceit. To die to our fears, our fears of being insignificant, our fears of being insecure, our fears of death. Give us the courage to die to those things. And give us the courage, the courage to follow you with an expectation that if we walk in your footsteps, we walk in the footsteps of new life. That if we follow Jesus, we are a new creation. That if we follow Christ, there is a real hope, a real victory. Give us the courage to reject our guilt and our shame. Give us the courage. Give us the courage not to hide from this amazing truth. Lord, we know that the rest of the community is waking up even now, looking forward to handing out eggs, and it doesn't even make any sense, Lord Jesus. And, but we, we admit, we confess that, that we lack the courage to tell them about you being alive. I lack that courage. I lack that courage to say that Jesus has taken away my sin. He's removed my guilt and my shame. He's given me hope and joy. I've hidden that in secret, God. And I've thought that by my religious actions, I could honor you in your death. But I realized that that was just like Joseph and Nicodemus. That when I'm just trying to honor you in death through hollow devotion and a guilty conscience, that I'm really just dead. Awaken us. Awaken us, Holy Spirit, to the resurrected Jesus. Awaken us to a new hope on a new day. Awaken us to a joy and a passion that our significance and our security is found in you and you alone. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's stand.